morning. morning. Let's go ahead and begin class with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you join us here today, enlighten our hearts and minds. We thank you for the privilege of studying about you. We ask that you will bless us here this morning, as well as our friends around the world, and the opportunities to share this message with others. We pray you will continue to advance this message. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And a couple of announcements. <clears throat> we, uh, Mark your calendars, really seriously, mark your calendars, March 21, Saturday, March 21, only six weeks from today, we've just gotten confirmation that we've, we're going to be at the Hamilton Community Church Saturday afternoon doing a new seminar where we're going to record a new DVD set that we'll have available for giving away this summer at the GC. And the new DVD set is going to be called The God-Shaped Church, Preparing People to Meet Jesus. And the talks are going to be, the first talk is going to be Growing Up in Christ, the Seven Levels of Moral Decision Making. And it will be, a, all of these will be PowerPoint and it's going to be expanded more than, than what you've ever heard in here before. The second talk is Becoming a Spokesperson for God, Telling the Story of the Cosmic Conflict from Beginning to End. Uh, really understanding how all those pieces fit together in the, in the landscape of time. And the third talk is going to be Answering Tough Bible Questions. And these are the questions we will answer. Why curse the ground? Why man to rule over woman? Why God killed people in the Old Testament? Why raise the wicked only to torture and kill them again? What's the truth about hell? What is the seal of God and the mark of the beast? And homosexuality in the Christian world. So we're going to do a presentation on all those topics. How many days? Yes. <laughs> it's going to go from 2 o'clock to 5.30. 2 o'clock to 5.30. One day? Yes. <laughs> Two o'clock to five thirty. I've been working on these programs. I have been working on these programs intensively. Uh, I worked like ten hours yesterday and last Sunday, and I've been really, 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 really working on these programs. Uh, but it's going to be recorded, so you can play it. It is going to be recorded, and I, you know, I'm not going to talk any faster than normal. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I, I, we, we need your help because it's only six weeks and we, we really felt that we needed to do this for the upcoming GC, an opportunity to get this perspective out there. It's going to add so much to what we've already got to share. And, um, but we need your help to recruit because we wanted to record a DVD, so we want the church full. Uh, again? March 21, six weeks from today from 2 to 6.30 p.m. at the Hamilton Community Church. We're going to try to get a flyer out between, you know, maybe, maybe by next week we'll have it here, or the week after. We'll try to get a flyer where you can take and share. Um, but we, we'd really like to see if you can't start signing people up and recruiting. I think you're going to find that this, this uh, will present some answers. I can tell you that the answers you're going to get are, uh, on some of these questions, like um, homosexuality in the Christian world is, is not anything you've heard before. It's going to blow your mind. I, I, I'm just going to tell you. But you're going to love it. You're going to go, wow, that is so plain. How come nobody's ever told us that before? Now, who's presenting besides you? Nobody. Okay. You say we, I'm thinking, okay. Uh, we as the ministry will be presenting, yeah. Thank you for, for asking. All righty, and as you know, um, we're planning on having a booth at the GC this summer, so um, uh, we're going to be taking most of our materials to give away, and this new DVD we're going to make on the 21st of March, we'll plan on being there as well. Look at the rest of our notes, the front, front pages for our upcoming speaking, of other, uh, speaking events. And then I received this email this week, I wanted to share it with you. I listen to some of your, so, something of yours almost every day, and I'm greatly blessed by your ministry. I give out watcher cards at every opportunity and also DVD sets, books, and cards. I wish everyone could have the chance to see our loving God and learn of his beautiful law of love and design for all life, his plan for healing our sin-sick hearts and minds, for securing the universe against this sin mess ever arising up again for all eternity, the way you and others now present it. It makes so much sense, is so hopeful, motivating, and exciting. Now for my story and prayer request. Late last night, I had a great fright finding a young man inside my enclosed porch trying to open my back door of my house. I came face to face with him through a window uh, in the door before I realized what was happening. I live alone and was very frightened. I was not very kind. I shouted at him and demanded he leave my house. And when he didn't, I called 911, retreated to the next room with, with a locking door. I could still see him through the window in, the, in that door. He stood there, face pressed against my glass door, uh, turning the doorknob, trying to get in until the police came, arrested him, and took him away. I was asked to write a statement and then called to have an officer come back to pick it up. 
I was quite shaken, but very thankful things hadn't turned out much worse. He was a 19-year-old kid from out of town, highly intoxicated, thought he was at his buddy's house and was determined to get inside. I felt compassion for him and prayed that I could think of something to do uh, with this opportunity and not waste it. After I wrote my statement, I prayed for wisdom for some way to help this young man who was about the age of my own nephew. Then I knew what I, what I needed to do. I wrote the following letter and slipped it inside the plastic cover of my last Healing the Mind DVD set. To the young man who came to my door tonight, you gave me a bad fright trying to open my back door late this evening. I realize now you were not here to steal or harm me, but were very drunk, lost, and disoriented. My heart truly goes out to you. I started thinking maybe it was not chance that brought you here. Maybe the God who created you and loves you guided you to this house because you are losing your way and need someone to care before it's too late. I'm trying to think of what I would want a kind stranger to do for my son if he were in your place. Then the idea came to give you my favorite DVD set, a series of talks by a very smart and compassionate man who makes it his life's work to help people learn to make better choices and live life the way we were designed to live, happy and satisfied, meeting our full potential. I hope you will take the time to watch them. They may be completely strange, like nothing you would watch normally, but something here might give you answers to life's hard questions, may help you navigate through this difficult time. Please watch them. I hate to see any young person wasting this precious gift of life, hurting their chance for good for for a good future. You might have wandered into the house of a person with a deadly weapon tonight and might not be here now. Please realize you are making some choices that could have very dire consequences. Don't throw your future away. You can do anything you choose to do. With God's help, you can make it great. I don't know your name, but I am praying for you. The officer, when he came to pick, pick up my written statement last night, would not take the letter and DVDs uh, to give to the young man in jail, but he told me how I could accomplish it. I had some legwork today, signing a request for a police case report at my police station so I could get the young man's address, explaining to them what I wanted to do. The secretary nearly wept, and within two hours she had typed everything up and ready for me to pick up. I had his name and address packaged up the DVD and just got home from the post office after mailing them with my letter. No return address. The seeds are planted. I'm so thankful I had your material here to share and I'm now praying that this young man will be convicted of the truth, one to trust in his healing and loving creator, that his life will be saved for God's kingdom. Please pray for this young man. Odin is his name. And could you please send me for five more DVDs? <laughs> I just thought that was really nice. Yeah, do you see the response? Instead of retribution, she's seeking redemption. Yeah. So our class today is lesson number eight in our quarterly Proverbs, and the title this week is Words of Wisdom. And the first paragraph, it says, to some degree, a great degree actually, we are all products of our environment. Though heredity plays a big role, the values we hold come to us from what is around us, our home, our education, our culture. From infancy, we are impacted by what we see and hear. Any thoughts or questions about the impact of genetics and environment? Yes. I've, I've heard, I'm going through a genetics class right now um, over at Southern. Uh, I hear that 80% is genetics and 20% is environment. What are your thoughts? You know, I think that's probably not correct. You could ask them, you could ask them, so is 80% of my language genetic? In other words, if, if I were born to English-speaking parents and grew up in China, I would still speak 80% English? But our behavior is what I'm talking about. Well, but see, we're talking about the whole person. And, then, and you think your behavior, how much of what you think and do is impacted by the language you speak? Can you think without using English? When you look outside, do you see a Baum, German word for tree, or do you see a tree? There are, first off, the language we speak impacts every aspect of our life. That's 100% environmental, not genetic. And then not just the language. Now, how did you, think how you learn language. How did it happen? Yes, could, you, could anybody in this room use their intelligence and their free will choices to uh, growing up in the home here in America to learn German or Chinese instead? Was it possible for you to avoid learning English? It's all environmental. Now, do you think English is the only thing that gets uploaded this way? No. So, so there is, the, the lesson is correct. There's a huge cultural perspective um, 
aspect to our views, our values, our, the way we see the world, our belief systems. But even as an adult, could you choose to learn a new language if you wanted to? Yeah, so depend, irrespective of what values and perspective we raise with, we can change that. Genetics actually set the, the foundation or the landscape, the, the biological limits upon which the environment acts. So you have a biological genetic predisposal limit on your athletic ability. Now you can train whatever that limit is, but you can't go beyond your biological predispositions or, or baselines. Some people will never be a Michael Jordan, even if they train twice as much as Michael Jordan trained. It won't happen. Same thing with musical. The musical is genetically predetermined in how the brain is wired, and some people are much more musically uh, predispositioned, but if they never, ever do anything musical, they, they don't actually develop musical talent or skills. Conversely, if they, if they practice an environment, an environment that's musically rich growing up, then those skills will advance and develop. Yes, you have a question. And you've told us so much about, yes, we are given a genetic bank from our mom and our dad, but the expression of that bank is very much controlled by our environment. So, so even if you've got a certain genetic, if that gene is dormant or active... Yes, yeah, so now we're talking the epigenetic expression. So um, a few years ago, it was discovered that there are two versions of a gene that codes for the serotonin reuptake pump which is the target for most of your modern antidepressants like Prozac and Zoloft. When not one neuron wants to talk to another neuron, it releases chemical in a little gap called a synapse, and the neuron that releases it has pumps like vacuum cleaners that will suck that back in and repackage again. And we have two different um, variants in the human genome that code for that particular um, pump. One is a long version gene and one's a short version gene. And, and what they discovered initially was, hey, pe this, this short version gene was much more highly represented in depressed people than non-depressed people. And therefore, the first thought was, well, therefore, it must be a, a gene that codes and makes you vault and codes for depression. We found the genetic link to depression. But then they actually did a little more research and discovered, no, it actually doesn't code for depression. It codes to sensitivity to one's environment. So if one has the short version gene and they're raised in a uh, trauma, stress-filled, uh, conflictual home environment or childhood experiences, then they have higher rates of depression than people with the same environment, but the long version of the gene. But if you have that same short version of the gene and you're raised in a nurturing, loving, secure environment, you do not have higher rates of depression. You actually become a leader in society or in the field that you go into because you have more sensitivity to your environment. So the genetics set the predisposition upon which environment will act, but that's not even all of it as well. So uh, if uh, they have genes that, uh, for instance, uh, the agouti gene, the agouti gene uh, codes and puts you at risk for being obese and diabetic. If the gene's expressed, you have uh, uh, a greater risk of obesity, lipidemia problems, um, diabetes type 2. If the gene is shut down, you have less risk of these things. What turns the gene on is plastics in our environment will turn this gene on. Uh, what shuts this gene down is um, methylating the gene, which you get methyl donor groups from things like B12 and folate, folic acid or folate. So if you have a diet that's rich in the, um, B, the B vitamins and folate, then you um, will shut this gene down. And studies show that in animal models that where, they, where they look at this, that if you give a, um, a mother who has this gene turned on, so she's obese, she's diabetic, uh, and you let her get pregnant, and then while, during her pregnancy you feed her with supplements of B12 and folic acid, it will shut this gene off so her children are born with the gene shut down and they will be thin and non-diabetic, and that shutdown will pass down three and four generations. Wow. Even if the subsequent generations don't get the methylfolate supplement, the, the uh, folate, folate acid and B12 supplementation in their diets, even if they don't get it, they still have this gene shut down, so they have an advantage. Study done on mice who were designed to uh, have, uh, actually be stupid. They were actually had a gene that caused memory problems. And uh, they took these, these cloned mice, so they have a group, all, all identical ones, they put them in two groups. One group just had normal upbringing, but the other group and their adolescence, for two weeks of their adolescence, were given what was called an enriched environment where they had lots of toys and things to play on and smells and things to climb over and stuff. And not surprising, the, the, the group that had the enriched environment, more exposure and experiences and textures to feel and smell, actually had better memory. That's not surprising to those who didn't have as many experiences. But what happened to do that was the gene that caused the bad memory became acetylated on the histone where it's, where it's stored, and it shut that gene off. Then they let those 
those pups, uh, as they grew up, they were allowed to have children of their own. And what happened was those children of those who had the exposure to the healthy adolescent environment were born with the defective gene, but the defective gene shut down so that they had normal memory even though they were not given the exposure to the positive childhood environments. And that passed down three and four generations. So, four generations, where have we heard that? Yes, and so when the scripture says the things pass down three and four generations, that's exactly what's happening. It's very biblical. It's epigenetic modifications that happen based on life experiences. If you actually look at, um, if you remember Darwin's finches, he uh, had these finches, and they had all these different beaks, and some beaks were better for grubs, and some beaks were better for getting stuff out of wood, and some were better for crushing seeds, and they were different shapes. And he postulated that there was, you know, over millions of years, you know, mutation in the gene sequencing that allowed some to have this different beak shape that would evolve to these different niches in the environment and be better advantaged. We actually now know by genetic, genetic testing, we've taken the different finches, we looked at their DNA sequencing, there are no mutation changes. They all have the exact same sequence. But environment cause them to have epigenetic modification. So they express the, the, um, the genes differently that cause their beaks to be different shaped within one or two generations. <clears throat> so when Darwin came along with his theory, it was a fine theory, there's nothing wrong with his theory. If he had actual genetic testing back then that they could have tested his theory in the lab and looked at it, then this whole Darwinian evolutionary theory would have been proved false right at the start. and It wouldn't have taken root and gotten into the psyches of millions of people and become dogma across the, the world. So... Anyway, none of that's in my notes, by the way. <clears throat> so you get the advantage if you listen instead of just read the notes. Okay, so genetic provides, the, the genes provide a library of information from which our potential is restricted. We can't go beyond the, the limits of the, the library of information. But environment determines which books in that library are opened and how they're expressed. And so the environment has a huge impact. So I, I'm going to tell you it's more than 80-20. So the second paragraph says, Unfortunately, what we, what we see and hear isn't always the best for us. The world around us has fallen in every way, and it cannot help impacting us negatively. Nevertheless, we have been given the promise of the Holy Spirit and we have God's word which points us to something higher. And I just thought about the promise of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do for us and when? Think of the work of the Holy Spirit. Think what the Holy Spirit's work is and, 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 and the sequence of how the Holy Spirit works in our life. What does it do for us and when? Have you ever thought of this? The Holy Spirit works in the hearts and minds of all people before they surrender to Christ to bring conviction, to, bring, uh, to, to draw, to woo, to bring a desire for something better, to have them be actually dissatisfied with a life out of harmony with God's design. That there is a, a certain level of, of uneasiness, restlessness, missing something, a longing for something better. The Holy Spirit is working to enlighten and, and draw to a better way for those who are unconverted. Uh, and, but the Holy Spirit always leaves us free. Always leaves us free to choose for ourselves which direction we'll go. Yes? If the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which we're given a list of, then we also have changed our characters with being in, in tune with the Holy Spirit. Yes, that comes, that comes a little bit down the road. It, that, you're exactly right. The whole, so the, but we're talking, the, the sequence, I was just trying to go with the sequence about the unconverted person doesn't have a character change yet, do they? No, no. So the whole, the, but the Holy Spirit's drawing, convicting, wooing, making us dissatisfied with being out of connection, and then leaves us free to choose. And then what you're saying happens when we choose to open the heart, then what happens? The Holy Spirit brings in. What the Holy Spirit bring in? This transforming thing where we get those fruits and character traits stuff. But he will also help us choose behaviors and activities and whatnot, mm -hmm. which will lead to those characteristics. Yes, and so, so for the converted person then, and many people pray in a converted, they've accepted Jesus, they're praying for some transformation, some victory in their life, and, and they, they misunderstand the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have to help them understand this. So for the converted person, the Holy Spirit's job is to bring light to your mind in ways you can comprehension on the decisions or actions you need to take at this point in your life in any given circumstance. Even bring a conviction of duty. Not necessarily a conviction of sin. It will do that too. But the Holy Spirit will bring a conviction of duty. This is the right. And you have a conviction. You know it's the right. Ever, anybody had that experience? But then the Holy Spirit leaves you free to decide. You, and you don't get the power to be victorious over the obstacle until you make the decision to do it. 
And many people stumble at this point. They pray for the wisdom, they pray for the enlightenment, and they also pray for the power before they've actually decided to do it. What they're wanting is they're wanting a supernatural change in their own mindset. They don't want to be responsible for making the decision. But it's when we make the decision, I choose to do this, that the Holy Spirit then empowers us with the strength to to follow. Because we never have to overcome an obstacle or resist a sin or, or make a life change with our own strength. But we don't get the strength until we actually choose to overcome the obstacle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Alrighty, so uh, Sunday's lesson, it says, unlike the theory of evolution, oh, actually, the first thing it says is that we are all equal. That's the, the title. Any thoughts about that title? We are all equal. Hmm. All right, so first, how is the title true? How are we all equal? In God's sight. We're all equal in God's sight. Uh, in moral value. In moral value as children of Adam, number one, and children of God, number two. In other words, descendants of Adam, we're all equal as part of God's creation in that sight. But how has this idea of equality been misunderstood in our society to cause lots of problems? Is it true that, we, if we're, that we're all, that it is true that we're all equal of moral worth, we're all equally loved by God, God loves us all, equally valuable in God's sight for redemption and transformation, equally in need of the same solution provided through Jesus Christ. You see this where we're equal, we're all equal. But is it true that we all are equal in talent, ability, and capacity? No. Yes, and that idea has corrupted our society. How has it corrupted our society? Because the idea of moral equality has bled over to the idea that therefore we're all equal in worth, excuse me, equal in ability, talent, and capacity. And it's caused ideas, first off, in the minds of people that if someone can do something, then so can I. Not if someone has the opportunity that I could have the same opportunity. Opportunity is different than accomplishment. If somebody else can do it, then so can I. And if I can't, then there's something wrong with me. So it leads this idea, we're all equal, and if that person can do it and I can't, then there must be something wrong with me. Which is, and if you haven't ever come across this, I come across this. It undermines a sense of well-being in oneself. It also drives to this competition that so many people compare themselves with other people. There's so much comparison. Well, you know, she, she's, she's thinner than me. She, she's this, she's that. Especially amongst women. They compare themselves with each other. <laughs> They really do, to a destructive end. So the guys. But when, I can tell you, guys do it too, but women do it much, much more, um, much more. And, but guys do it too, guys do it too. Guys do it more along the things of career advancement, money, finance. Women do it a, much more about their person, much more about their person. Yes, you have a thought. I think that's really voiced loudly in our culture by the phrase, you can do anything. Well, no, you can't. Yeah. So, and then in our educational system. I'm going to tell you, our educational system has been corrupted by this idea. We all have equal worth as humans and therefore deserve equal opportunity. But some have made the mistake to think that we are all equal in ability and therefore they prescribe a rigid educational pathway, a pigeonholing, pigeonholing of everyone down the same track regardless of their ability or capacity or talent. This has resulted in serious damage to both our in- individuals stuck in that system and our society as a whole. Do all people have the same musical ability? Let's use it metaphorically for a moment. What would happen if we lived in a society that required every member of the society to become competent enough musician to be able to make a living as a musician? That was a requirement. You had to take musical lessons, and if you didn't, if you couldn't make a living as a musician, then you would get an F. You would fail, or a D minus. You, or you, would, you, you, you couldn't advance to the next grade. What would happen? Mm-hmm. Think about your own development. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not Mr. Musical. Mm-hmm. What would have happened growing up in a, in, a, in a society that looked at your value and worth at how well you can play a musical instrument? And you're not musical. Now, the musicians would love this. They haven't, they haven't, but, but many of us are, do you understand musical ability is not the only ability that varies from person to person biologically? Not everyone is academically gifted. Not everyone is math and math gifted, but we have this pigeonholing and what we do then, and you think about these, these vulnerable adolescent egos 
looking to, to find who they are. This is me, and, and I'm worth something, and I'm valuable, and I'm good at something. Yeah, but you're pigeonholed down an educational pathway now where you're not academically inclined, and so you're not good at this, and the whole society is telling you, well, you're a C minus, you're a D, you're an F, but maybe you're a mechanical genius. Maybe you're one of these people who can break down things and put them together with your hands in an incredible way. Maybe you're a gifted craftsman, a stone worker, a, a mechanic, a, a, a carpenter. Let's see, there was a carpenter 2,000 years ago. I went, um, but do you see how we don't do this? And then this causes kids that are academically pigeonholed but don't have that skill to lose confidence. They begin insecure. Their self-esteem falls. So they need to validate themselves in some way. And what do they do? They turn to the gangs. They go into a gang where they can be the biggest thug or the, the one who does the most vandalism or the one who steals the most or the one who sells the most drugs for their gang or whatever else there is there to do. Or they go on Facebook and, and they do the most lewd and crude behavior and they get, everybody get notoriety at school like, well, I couldn't believe you did. That was the grossest thing I ever saw. You're like the grossest. Okay, I'm, I'm number one at being the grossest. And, it makes them, and their ego grows. And this is what we do. Why? Because we have con- perverted this idea of equality. I saw a hand, yes. I think that we have, um, with what you're saying there, we have, as a society, uh, put a lot more value, like you say, on intellect, the mental abilities, so that a a young person may um, have that mental ability, but to serve in a field field that is totally academic, Yes. It's not their personality where they uh, are feel reward. And, but yet they feel like to achieve what's expected because they have the ability, they have to do that. So they, they, they deny themselves the fulfillment for that reward that society gives them. And I, that's a shame. I'm not running for political office. <laughs> but I will tell you, I think that a solution that would be brilliant for our society and for people is if we had a, a short academic um, pathway that everyone learns the basics to read and write and balance their checkbooks and basic stuff. But after maybe the sixth grade, they begin tracking people down what they're good at, vocational pathways, and actually reinstitute apprenticeships. I don't know if any of you have ever had to hire a handyman, a craftsman of some sort. Uh, you know, the, 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 quality of, the quality of work in this country the, from the day of an apprenticeship where somebody might train for 12 years before they're allowed to go out and be a carpenter, that does, or a brick mason, or whatever it is, that, that's gone. And, and to track people down after the sixth grade where they're actually going to then go out and work and get a paycheck, but as an apprentice, and then maybe for the next six years they're going to work as an apprentice before they can actually be a, be a, you know, a, a full-time person in that field, I think it would be great for our society. As a function of what, what Joel just said, yes. we put value, don't put value there. So we're losing skills. Uh, there's, there's shortages of those skills right now. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are. And it would, but ego, ego structure for the people doing this, if they were good in these fields, it would, it would help them develop a healthy sense of well-being. They wouldn't need to turn to some of these more um, community dysfunctional pathways like gangs and, and stuff to find a sense of, of purpose. Yes? But we don't have mechanisms by which we can safely evaluate potential. <laughs> yeah. And so it becomes an issue of my father was a um, stone carver, so my son becomes a stone carver, and my, whatever. Or he's put off into some other field in which they have contact. Well, you know, I don't think that's actually true. I think we can act, uh, do a pretty good job of assessing academic abilities and, and cognitive abilities for math and, and, uh, and reading and writing. Some of these things can be assessed pretty accurately these days with the neuropsych testing. Um, more like bloomers. Yes, and so... So, so you, guys are, you guys are raising political objections, not theory. Yes, so you just, if you're going to look at it functionally and how operationally, you always build in opportunities to cross back over, but we're talking a general principle that you help people find what they're good at and develop that skill in their life rather than forcing people down a track with no options. So you build in new options for people. Yes, but well, we're going to move on for, to our class. <laughs> what? Everything is time and grade based rather than individual. Yes, exactly. But the point is, this idea of equality, though, is we have failed to recognize people can have equal worth and not be equal in ability. That's all I'm trying to say. This comes, I was in the military. I can tell you the male-female thing. It's one of those things. 
that really came, they, 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 you know, with the whole gender equality aspect in the military, I'm gonna tell you, women are not equal to men when it comes to carrying a 240 pound soldier on their back a, a mile and a half out of enemy lines to an aid station. And if you think they are, <laughs> put it to the test, they're not. That doesn't mean they're not equal in moral worth, equal in intelligence, equal in ability to operate a machine, uh, they can, but, but not to carry somebody my size out of the combat zone, they're not equal. Does anybody disagree with that? No. no. Yes. With Germany did that, does that. They actually have tracks. They test the kids and they, they have tracks. And the people that they interviewed on the show I was watching where it talked about their educational system, the, the kids that went into that system were actually very happy with their factory job or this or that because they were early on, saw their potential, and kind of got them going in a track that they could succeed in. People want to succeed. They want to be good at something. Yes. Um. Yeah, I, I think people do better at things that they're motivated to do and that they are interested in. And that reinforces people are motivated to do things they're good at. It's a reinforcement loop. I was very fortunate to escape the Adventist young man going through high school, uh, college, with about four career options. Remember those days? Yeah. And I didn't particularly choose that career option that I really wanted to. I took the one my parents wanted me to take. I went to school for 19 years, got a master's degree in a whole different area, and within three years I was doing what I wanted to do, which had been what I wanted to do before, and the only reason that I was able to pursue that was I was just in a very fortunate place. So, you know, I got paid to do my hobby, and so, therefore, I think I do better at it. I think that, you know, I'm more motivated to keep doing it. And uh, it's just a, it's something that we need to give more kids more options. And also, parents, when you have kids, be careful about how much you pressurize them to do what you want to do. Yeah, I see that, too. To do that. So let's, let's, let's get into something a little more controversial. <laughs> In the first paragraph, unlike the theory of evolution, which considers all, us all to be nothing but chance products of a mindless cosmos, the Bible teaches that all humans were created by God. Does it? Well, you were, God created you just exactly the way you are. So it, the, 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 this, is, this idea, this is another idea that corrupts. It really is. But the, but the Bible, the, the lesson, fortunately, does point us to a very appropriate Bible text, Acts 17, 26. And this is what it says. From one man he created all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked their appointed times in history and so forth. Does that passage give us insight into how God created all the nations? From one man he created all the nations. So what was the method according to this passage? Who, who did God actually create? Adam. Adam, that's right. And gave that one man along with his wife an ability to procreate. Go, be fruitful and multiply. And as we talked about the epigenetics in here already, as they make decisions in the free uh, universe, they change themselves and they pass those changes along to children creating, as God created a being in his image, he gave Adam and Eve the ability to create beings in their image. And the acorns really don't fall far from the tree in this way. They really don't, when most of the time. So the implications of this truth, does it mean that God is directly involved, personally, his physical hand and divine power in creating each individual human being since Adam? No. Do you understand? This is commonly the belief. This is commonly the belief, and it, it really has a corrupting idea on how we see and understand God. When a man rapes a woman and she gets pregnant, is God creating to the rape victim, sir. Thank you, God, for creating a new life. Do you understand? There are many, many Christians that believe, well, yes, that, that's God creating. Yeah. They, they believe that. What kind of a God is that? It really corrupts our view of God. Yes. As I said a while ago, if you're born with a horrible birth defect, then God created you exactly the way you are. So if somebody's born with a congenital, and I get this all the time, why did God want me to have schizophrenia? Why did God create my child with Down syndrome? Why did God create me with bipolar? Did he? Does he? No, he doesn't. How about this one? Um, if a child is born with a congenital defect, and you take this view that God's doing it, if a doctor tries to fix that, is he going against the divine will? Some people think so. Mm -hmm. 
So we shouldn't fix cleft palates, and we shouldn't fix conge- uh, heart defects. We shouldn't fi- fix spinal bifida. We should just let these kids suffer and die. Shouldn't have anesthesia during childbirth. Shouldn't have anesthesia during childbirth. There you go. <laughs> no, because the Bible says that in their pain, you see, they have to feel that pain. How dare we take away that? Okay. <laughs> Does God create sin? Does God create sinful beings? Well, the Bible says we're born in sin, conceived in iniquity, Psalms 51. So if we're going to lay that God directly doing it, then we're going to have to say, well, God, how many of you were born sinless? Well, wait a second then. If God's doing it, then we can go right to him and say, God, you made me a sinner. Did he? No. No. If you actually look in Scripture, there are only three human lives that the Scripture gives God direct hand in. Adam, Eve, the incarnation of Christ. And all three of them were sinless at the creation when God had his hand in it. And then Adam, Eve, of course, didn't stay that way. Fortunately, Christ stayed that way. It's a huge, it's huge, folks, this idea. It goes to so much Fear. I can't tell you the people who live in an oppressed state because they believed God wanted them to be this way with this problem. I have patients all the time, good Christian folk, good heart, but they've been told a lie. Remember, lies have power over us. We have power of what we believe, but what we believe will hold power over us. And imagine that you actually believed God wanted you to be deaf, or God wanted you to be blind, or God wanted you to be schizophrenic, or whatever it might, that God wanted this for you. Because he had a plan. Yes, I hear this all the time because he has a plan. You hear it on the news. You heard this uh, with uh, Palin. Didn't she have a Down syndrome child? You remember this? God wanted, God wanted us to have a, a Down syndrome child. It was all over the news when she was running for office. How do you distinguish between that view and saying, God did not intend this, but everything passes his hand, so he did allow it. Yes, because how does God operate? How does he operate? In free will. Because what can't exist without freedom? Love, love can't exist without freedom. Uh, but when, a, when a, well, I, I talk, talk to this, 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 maybe this idea will help you too, because I have some people who don't necessarily believe that God did this to them, but they struggle with why did God allow my wife to have this, this particular defect that resulted in her dying at a young age? She had some genetic problem that resulted in, say, breast cancer, the breast cancer gene, blah, 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 blah. Why did he allow this? Why, why didn't he stop that from happening, blah, blah, blah? And I point out that in this world in which we live, the reason any of us uniquely, who we are, me, I'm here because of one particular ovum from my mother got together with one particular sperm from my dad. If my mother would have, and my dad would have had relations with any other month of my mother's cycle throughout her entire life, I would be one of my siblings. It wouldn't be me. Do you hear what I just said? Do you get your mind around this idea? If your parents would have skipped that month that you were conceived, you would not exist. There was one ovum that could be you. One and only one. You follow me? Am I right? Dr. Bird? You know, my son's showing me a, a verse here with David where, you know, he talks about God forming us. And oh, knitting us together in the mother's womb? Inward parts, all of those things. And I think that's where the confusion becomes. So how does God knit together? How does he knit together? So if a child, if a child is born with spinal bifida, does that mean God was having a bad knitting day? <laughs> if, if, who's stronger, God or a sinful human being? Who's stronger? So if God is knitting and a woman is drinking a bottle of vodka a day, who wins, the divine hand of God knitting or the vodka so that child's born with fetal alcohol syndrome? Who wins? Well, God's not very powerful if he can't even overcome a bottle of vodka if he's directly using his divine power. You see, the evidence does not support that text means God is directly doing it. What it means is that God has ordained his design and the laws that he sustains upon physics and the laws of health, which the universe operates upon. And it's through these laws and his design that he is knitting together, not his direct hand doing it. This is how this means. Does that make sense? 
So, so back then to this question, I have patients who then, uh, who struggle with that. My, my spouse has this problem. And I point out, you understand, you could not have your spouse without that problem. Well, their siblings don't have it. That's exactly right. Because it, there was a different ovum without that gene on it, with a different sperm without that gene on it. And you could have a sibling of your spouse, but you can't have your spouse. Did y'all follow that? In this world, it was those two. And, that, and that, that's, that's that whole chromosomal complement that comes together to make each one of us who we are. It's really freeing for a lot of people. Why did God allow it? Because it's the only way that individual in this world of sin in which defects happen could exist. But the good news is when the Lord comes, all this corruption puts on incorruption and all this mortal puts on immortality. All these genetic defects are taken away. We get brand new hardware, brand new physiology. We're not promised new hardware or new biology here on earth. We're promised new software, new hearts and right spirits, new minds, new characters, new motives on a corruptible hardware. That's what we get here. This is, this, is, this is actually a huge life cascading issue. It enters in so many phases of day-to-day living in our sense of well-being. So I encourage you to think about it. Third paragraph says, sin is another universal equalizer. The rhetorical question of the proverb, the, the answer no one points to the tragic and hopeless condition of the humankind. Humans are all weak and mortal and yet all, uh, and all the money and power in the world will not change that. Yet it is in the context of scripture that this reference to human sinfulness should not lead to despair because Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection have paved the way for anyone, no matter how sinful, to have the promise of eternal life, and this life comes solely through faith in him. And I want to just suggest to you that this promise of eternal life, as it's often presented, um, is that all we get is the promise of eternal life? In other words, when a person exercises faith in Jesus and accepts him as their savior, are they really getting future eternal life insurance? You see, the promise of eternal life. That's what they're getting, the promise of eternal life. I'm not suggesting we don't have that promise, but I'm suggesting presenting it like this undermines the victories and transformations that we are to experience here and now. When we actually accept Jesus in our, in our lives now, don't, don't we get a new heart and right spirit, new motives? Don't we have the guilt and shame removed and we find peace with ourselves and, and with our Lord? Don't we get a purity of character here now? Aren't we transformed to be like Christ in the way we think and we act? Isn't that supposed to be part of the victory that leads ultimately into a life eternal that we can walk into heaven like Elijah did because we are growing in our relationship and transformation with him? I think sometimes this legal salvation that is presented is presented as that you accept Jesus, a legal thing happens in the heavenly courts, you get something stamped on your heavenly eternal life insurance policy, and then when the Lord comes, you're granted that, but there's no transformation here. Yeah, Wendell. Of he has passed from death to life. Yes. And that was Christ's statement. You know, he, is, um, he has already passed from death to life. Or he says those who believe in him will never die. Will never die. Or life eternal will say they might know you. So we are to be actually in possession of eternal life today, not have the promise of eternal life for sometime in the future. We are to be possessing eternal life now. Mm-hmm. Isn't that profound? And the reason we have the promise of eternal life is because we're what we possess now and what's occurring in us because that's what that's what produces life yep so uh, last paragraph it comes from uh, faith and works page 20 it says if man cannot by his own good works merit salvation then it must be holy of grace received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in jesus it is wholly a free gift justification by faith is placed beyond controversy and all this controversy is, is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man and his good works can never procure eternal life for him. So, with that in mind, how do you balance that statement, which seems pretty black and white, right? With these two statements. This is the first one's out of Lift Him Up, page 193. While God was working in Daniel and his companions to will and do according to his good pleasure, they were working out their own salvation. Herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation, without which no true success can be attained. Human effort avails nothing without divine power, and without human human endeavor, divine effort is with many to no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. And this is our high calling, page 310. 
There are two grand forces, two grand forces at work in the salvation of the human soul. It requires the cooperation of man with the divine agencies, divine influences, and a strong, living, working faith. It is in this way only that the human agent can become laborers together with God. The Lord does not sanction in any one of us a blind, stupid credulity. I love that. You know what blind, stupid credulity is? God said it, I believe it. That settles it. That's what blind, stupid credulity is. He does not dishonor the human understanding, but far from this, he calls for the human to be brought into connection with the divine will. He calls for the ingenuity of the human mind, the tact, the skill to be strenuously exercised in searching out the truth as it is in Jesus. Ye are laborers together with God. So how do you balance those two? If you don't have those two, you don't have free will. So how do you balance that with the, with the statement, the first statement, that there's nothing that we do, no works we provide, there are no works that we provide, but if you don't have those two, then you don't have a God of free will. Because another word for human, the human effort, the human involvement, is choice, is free will, is freedom. Any other thoughts about this? How do you balance it? Think through, Think through design law versus imposed law. If you're still having um, vestiges of imposed law in your mind, you'll struggle with these passages. How does that work? I can't take any credit. It's legally, he's done it all. Da, da, da. But if you think of design law, it all falls into balance immediately. Because under design law, then you understand that Christ, we, we understand that when Adam sinned, the human species was out of harmony with how life is constructed to operate in a terminal condition. And there was no work any of us could do to remedy the situation, to find remedy for this condition. Christ came and took our iniquity upon himself, partook of our state in the order to restore it back to God's original design, to provide remedy, to fix what Adam broke. So in Christ alone, in Christ alone, he has fixed or restored or provided remedy to the fallen human condition. However, that remedy procured solely by Christ alone must be partaken of. And when you partake of remedy, you don't create remedy, you don't work for remedy, you don't solve your own problem, you don't come up with a solution, you simply partake with the solution that Christ has provided, but you will not get well unless you cooperate and partake. It's so simple and makes so much sense when you understand design law, and thus you read in Desire of Ages 762. Notice these words, and she sums up with the idea of justification again. The law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character. And this man has not to give. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, coming to earth as man, lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. Now, which character did he develop? A divine character or a human character? See, he already had perfect divine character. There were perfect there were angels in heaven with perfect angelic characters. Uh, if you believe there are unfallen beings in other worlds, they have perfect characters of their order. But until Christ, there's no perfect human character. A human character without any sin of any kind, no shortcoming, no fall of any kind. Christ developed perfect human character. These he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. His life stands for the life of men. In other words, he becomes the new head of humanity where Adam should have been. He is now our leader. Our, uh, our, our progenitor, we're descendants of him. We were grafted into the vine now. We receive life from him, not the life that we receive from Adam. Thus, we have remission of sins that are past. Where do you think we get this from? According to this statement. This statement is it remission of sins that are past through the legal payment made to our account. Now get, get this. Remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. What? You mean he didn't have to be pled with? He didn't have to be paid off? Nothing? He just... Was gracious? Can you believe you've got a God of grace? Some people can't believe it. He has to be pled with. He has to be paid. It's not really gracious. His life stands for the life of men. They have remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. More than this, Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. He builds up the human character after the similitude of the divine character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty. Thus, the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. God can be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. Why is it just? Because just means right. And is it right for the creator, the designer, to take his creation that is dying in terminal condition and to fix it and to heal it? Is that right to do? Yes. And then is it right? Is it a right thing to do to take that remedy and to imbue it into those who are dying to set them right? 
that's just and justifying. Healing. Remedy and healing. That's what that means. Monday's lesson. Ooh, I think we'll just skip Monday because we're running late. Let's jump to Tuesday. Unless somebody actually had a burden on Monday, we can talk about it. Um, it says in Proverbs 20:17, in Tuesday's lesson, food gained by fraud tastes sweet, but one ends up with a mouthful of gravel. Is it talking only about food? What, what, why does it turn to gravel? Metaphor, of course. What does gravel do? If you're chewing on gravel, what's going to happen? It's going to cause a lot of pain and suffering and damage, Okay. What happens to the character, the conscience, the ability to reason and think, the soul, the image of God in man if you cheat and lie and steal? It corrupts you. It destroys you. It damages you. This is what it's saying. And is that an imposed punishment? Well, it's retribution. You did wrong, so God now has to have an accounting with you and make you pay. Or is it a natural consequence of deviating for how God constructed things? This is design law. Yeah, you can't get healthy outside the design. If you are an immature Christian, though, levels one through four of moral development, you see this as proscribed. God has rules. You broke the rules. God does this to you. And when you're level five and seven, you actually see design law, and you say, wait a minute, this is what happens when you deviate from how life is built to work. You know what? Many of you know I'm going to Australia in a few months uh, to do a series down there. I'll be down there for four weeks in in New Zealand. And um, there's an individual down there who's gone online and posted a, uh, a lengthy paper criticizing what we teach, or maybe I should say what I teach. And uh, in his paper, this is, this is one of the things he says. This is a quote. It's online, it's, and, and, it's, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because several different churches have pastors or elders have been concerned because they read this paper. Remember from last week we talked about, you know, um, the, the proverb that said something about the uh, prosecution always sounds the win, uh, uh, winsome or persuasive until the uh, other side is heard. Okay, Okay. so these people are concerned, uh, but this is what he wrote, one section of what he wrote. Now, to me, it seems perfectly rational that a loving God would nevertheless be willing to be fair, even if being so was painful to himself, to inflict pain on the man that ordered torture for a humble servant of Jesus seems only just. In fact, it is when the persecutors are already dead that the blood of the martyrs call out for God to avenge our blood in Revelation 6. So painful punishment seems rational to me and irrational to Jennings. And then he wrote this. Speaking of the ten plagues, the final ten plagues. These plagues are punitive rather than corrective. That is, they occur after the close of human probation. And the suffering is fair. It is just. God is holy who judges the wicked. It is, it is obvious, manifest, manifest according to the righteous one of Revelation 15. That God is torturing and making people suffer to make retribution upon them. Well, this is what happens when you see levels one through four of moral development and you see God's laws and imposed system of rules, then it would be unfair if you had rules that you didn't enforce. And so, because this is where things are, and they don't understand design law and how things are actually built to run, they, they view it this way. But listen to a historic Seventh-day Adventist view on the ten last plagues and, and what happens with the wicked in the end. This was written, a manuscript release page, of volume 14, page 3. I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon them, but in this way. They place themselves beyond his protection. He warns, corrects, reproves, and points out the only path of safety. Then if those who have been the object of his special care will follow their own course, independent of the Spirit of God, after repeated warnings, if they choose their own way, then he does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attack upon them. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on land, bringing calamity and distress and sweeping off multitudes to make sure of his prey. And storm and tempest, both by sea and land, will be, for Satan has come down with great wrath. He is at work. He knows his time is short, and he is not restrained. We shall see more terrible manifestation of his great power than we have ever dreamed of. And then this is Review and Herald, September 17, 1901. God keeps a reckoning with the nations. Ooh. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without his notice. Those who work evil toward their fellow men saying, how doth God know, will one day be called upon to meet long-deferred vengeance. 
In this age, a more than common contempt is shown to God. Men have reached the point in insolence and disobedience which shows that their cup of iniquity is almost full. Many have well nigh passed the boundary of mercy. Soon God will show that he is indeed the living God. He will say to the angels, no longer combat Satan in his efforts to destroy. Did you hear that? So he's, he's, it's, a, it's a vengeance coming. Here's an, and what does God tell his angels to do? No longer combat Satan in his efforts to destroy. Let him work out his malignity upon the children of disobedience, for the cup of their iniquity is full. They have advanced from one degree of wickedness to another, adding daily to their lawlessness. I will no longer interfere to prevent the destroyer from doing his work. Are you saying the ten last plagues are from Satan? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what happens. But I'll give you scripture in case you don't like what Ellen White said, but she got this from scripture. And here is Revelation 1, excuse me, Revelation 7, 1 through 3. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds to, pre- to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming to the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. So these angels are actively doing what? But they're given power to do what? To harm the land and the sea. How do they harm it? By letting go what they've been harming, what they've been holding back. And what have they been holding back? The winds of strife, which is a metaphorical way of saying Satan and his agencies. And that's what was more clearly written in those two quotes from Ellen White. And then, Satan is the destroyer. God is the restorer. How happy must Satan be when we, from the pulpits of America, in our literature, in our printed word, teach that God is the destroyer, God is the source of death. This is out of Faith I Live by page 165. The Savior in his miracles revealed the power that is continually at work in man's behalf to sustain and to heal him. Through the agencies of nature, God is working day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment to keep us alive, to build us up and restore us. When any part of the body sustains injury, a healing process is at once begun. Nature's agencies are set at work to restore soundness, but the power working through these agencies is the power of God. All life-giving power is from him. When one recovers from disease, it is God who restores him. Sickness, suffering, and death our work of an antagonistic power. Satan is the destroyer. God is the restorer. But do you understand? Satan has corrupted our view of God. We've got this idea of of retributive justice that we teach that God is the source of inflicted pain, inflicted destruction, and inflicted death. And thus we teach God is like Satan. And it's a lie. And this is what God is waiting for, for people to finally cast off these distortions and come back to the end of time to say, wait a minute, fear God, be in awe of him, give him glory, reveal his character, because the time has come in earth's history for people to make a right judgment that God is not like Satan says he is. God is like Jesus revealed him to be. Judge him rightly. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth. Worship the designer and stop worshiping this Roman dictator that you projected into heaven in your own mind. And I really had some fun stuff, but I guess we won't get to all that stuff because we're just out of time, aren't we? So I encourage you to, to look at the lesson. There's a lot more questions in here from Wednesday's lesson about, um, uh, and, uh, about, about character development and so forth. Well, maybe I'll just run the questions by you real fast. Let me read this and run the questions by you. It says, a person's character is measured less by wisdom or even religious uh, commitments than by readiness to help the poor and the needy. I won't go through the rest of the paragraph, but, it, but the paragraph brings these questions to mind. I'll leave these with you to contemplate this afternoon. Which is more important, character development or religious affiliation? <laughs> Can someone have Christ-like character and not be, lo- be a member of an organized church? Yeah. Can someone have eternal life and not be a member of an institutional church? Yes. What does helping the poor mean? Is it giving hand out or hand up? What's the difference? Do we help more by supplying answers or giving opportunities to solve problems? Think about your math, math and learning math. What helps you more, getting the answer given to you or having the opportunity to solve the problem? Do we help more by lifting burdens or assisting people in lifting their own burdens? 
Can success be given to a person? In Christian worldview, what does a successful life look like? Does it look like developing a Christ-like character? Can Christ-like character be given to a person other than in their relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, can you give it to another person? How can we create opportunity for personal development, hope, and an atmosphere for success? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of your character, how you've designed life and the universe to actually run on truth, love, and freedom. Wow, we see how gracious, benevolent, patient, kind, merciful that you are. How you sent Christ to fix the condition that Adam put upon this creation so that we can be brought back into unity and oneness with you. We ask that your spirit be poured out now and take all that Christ has achieved, reproduce it in us so it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me and that we might become partakers of your divine nature, transformed to be like you in the way we think, the way we understand reality, the way we practice our lives, revealing the truth about you. We pray in your holy name, amen. And, and, and I'm gonna make...